think um, we can start now and people will just join in once we start so that we don't keep you uh, much on time. Um, first of all, I would like to welcome all of you to our fifth session on the webinar series, Digitization and Innovation, the New Normal. The, this webinar series is organized by the AUC School of Business Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation Business Association. Our focus today would be on retail, retail and consumer goods. Uh, what we're focused for today will be much more on consumer services. And I believe consumer services attracts much more, more attention than goods due to its uh, 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 impact and uh, uh, possible um, uh, effects that during the Definitely COVID-19 has dramatically disrupted with the shock in the, our known brick and mortar uh, shops versus our online shops and ordering everything on. Also between the essential versus non-essential services, the between the small versus large retailers and service providers. Yet, while some retailers are seeing demand fall away and customers have shift channels, others are facing unprecedented spikes in demand. For example, grocery retailers are dealing with significant to predict and manage the demand has never been more important seen these days than before. What about the facilities and home services as demand for more contactless services have boomed? What have our uh, guest speakers done in that domain? We, will, we are gathered here today to listen their insights and their speech. Uh, before starting the session, I would like to highlight some of the webinar logistics. Uh, this webinar will be recorded. Once we start, all uh, participants will be muted, except, of course, for the panelists. The webinar duration is almost 60 minutes. The Q&A will start at the end of the panel discussions. The floor will be open for Q&A. If you have any questions, uh, please raise your hand or type your question in the chat box. Uh, the session moderator will uh, will direct and ask your question to a specific speaker. If you did not mention which uh, speaker uh, is uh, the question directed to. Now I would like to uh, welcome Dr. Hamid Shema. Dr. Shema will be moderating our today's session. Dr. Shema is Associate Professor of Marketing at the AUC School of Business. And uh, welcome, Dr. Shema, and thank you for your time to uh, moderate this session. Uh, Dr. Shema will also be presenting the speakers. Thank you. The floor is thank yours, you. Dr. Shema. Thank you very much, Hela, for this uh, introduction. Uh, welcome uh, once again to our uh, participants. I can see uh, some of my students are here, so good to see you once again. So uh, we are delighted that you are joining us today in this series of uh, webinars uh, under digitalization and innovation, the new normal. And the focus of today will be on consumer goods with a focus on service goods. We have really uh, three distinguished panel members with us. Uh, Hossam uh, Allam is the CEO of Hassan Allam Properties and Facilities Management, board member of Hassan Allam Construction, he is the chief executive of Hassan Alam Property Management, a, a subsidiary of Egypt's leading construction and real estate group with a client list, including industrial, corporate, commercial, heritage, and infrastructure asset owners. Previously to this role, he spent 10 years in Shell International, developing natural gas projects at various stages of maturity. He is also uh, involved in two non-professional causes. The first is Blue Collar Mobility, where he sits in the board of the US NGO, Education for Employment, and has chaired the GIZ uh, funded National Employment Pact. The other is entrepreneurship, where he has founded uh, Cairo Angels, the uh, leading network of business angels in the Middle East and Africa. Today, he also chairs the Cairo Angels Syndicate Fund. 
welcome uh, engineer Hussein. Our second uh, distinguished uh, panel speaker with us is Mr. Ayman Ashur. He is the principal of Newton International Management, a company focused on technology and mobility investments. Uh, Ayman has a 20 year corporate career in the security industry before founding Blue Hill ID and leading it to NASDAQ. Ayman is an adjunct lecturer in uh, Suffolk University, fellow of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators and a member of several startup boards. He is the founder and principal of Newton International Management, an advisory and investment firm focused on technology with a special focus on mobility, payment, identification, and security markets since 2000. He served as the chairman and CEO for Identiv, uh, which he joined in 2010 following the combination of Blue Hill ID and SCM Microsystems. Uh, he earlier founded Blue Hill ID, an RFID technology company in 2007. Uh, his professional experience includes several executive positions within the security and identification technology industries. He has served as the CEO of uh, ASA Ablois Identification Technology Group, ITG, where he was responsible for building one of the most successful RFID companies. He was the regional manager, uh, managing director of Williams PLC in the Asia Pacific region, where he was responsible for the Chubb Security, uh, KD and Yale brands in Asia, as well as the global operations of Guard Force and the Chubb Physical Security Group and earlier served as the president of a number of uh, KIDI units in North America, global marketing director of KIDI in the UK. Uh, Mr. Ayman Ashur has a BSc in electronics and electrical engineering, diploma in international arbitration law, and serves as an adjunct lecturer in Suffolk University in Boston, MA, where he has been teaching uh, mergers and acquisitions at the Sawyer Business School for the MBA program since 2012. So uh, welcome, uh, Mr. Ashur. We are very much delighted to have you with us uh, as part of our panel speakers. Uh, third, but not least, uh, Mr. Ahmad Gelen, the CEO and co-founder of uh, Taskiti, leading startup that provides a digital marketplace for home services. Uh, Gelen is a former dentist who graduated from the Faculty of Dentistry, Tanta University, but e-commerce coding and digital marketing has always been his biggest passion, even before starting, uh, starting uh, Taskiti. Uh, before 2008, his focus was enabling SMEs to create business opportunities through the internet. And in 2013, and after multiple small projects, he decided to quit dentistry and follow his passion by co-founding Taskiti, which became the leading online marketplace for home services in Egypt. Taskiti.com is serving 20 different services to thousands of customers every month and is creating jobs for more than 1,000 technicians. Taskiti joins flat, uh, joined Flat6 Labs before raising multiple rounds of investments from the Cairo Angels, 500 Startups, Seed Stars, Vision uh, Ventures Capital. Taskiti also won the MIT uh, IIC competition for Africa and were qualified for the global finance. We are very much also delighted to have you with us, Mr. Ahmad Galan, and we look forward to hearing from you about uh, your story. So I would like to start by sharing with you uh, a quote or part of the McKinsey report that came out a few months ago on consumer goods and retail companies. So for consumer goods and retail companies, the impact of these world-shaking events hasn't been uniform. In some cases, things are going well, in some cases not. Some companies have been among the hardest hit, suffering massive sales decline and laying off thousands of employees during lockdowns. Whereas other companies faced unprecedented spikes in demand and had to rapidly expand their workforces. Meanwhile, trends have accelerated at a pace that until recently was unimaginable. Changes that otherwise might have taken a decade instead happened in days. Digitalization, online ordering and delivery and remote working became widespread practically overnight. So with that, 
uh, what is going on in the service part of retail? Retail, by the way, is not only, you know, buying from a supermarket, as many people might think. Retail, uh, you know, comprises a lot of different, uh, you know, industries, including the uh, supermarket, the electronics, and many service businesses, and most uh, new businesses now and startups are more service oriented than tangible goods oriented. So with that, uh, let us uh, have the opinion of engineer Hossam Alam uh, that has really wealth of experience in the service industry. What is going there? What are the clients, uh, you know, uh, expectations today? Are they buying more? They're buying less. So would love to hear, uh, you know, uh, the industry, uh, you know, expert here, uh, engineer Hossam Alam, and know to him more, especially, you know, within the service domain. So with that, uh, I leave the floor to you, Engineer Hussein. Thank you very much, Dr. Hamid. Uh, good evening to everybody and thank you for attending the session. Thank you also to the AUC for inviting me along these distinguished speakers. So I run a facilities services company. Uh, we do maintenance, cleaning, security, catering, all various manpower services. And we serve a wide segment of customers including shopping malls, corporate headquarters, government buildings, factories, and so on. So although I'm not an expert on any one of my clients' industries, I do get a cross-section of uh, and flavor of which ones behave how at what times. So for example, when the currency devalued, I had a certain set of clients that did very well and others that suffered uh, during the you know, revolution of 2011, uh, similar. And recently with COVID, we've seen similar kind of uh, patterns. Some did very well, some did very badly. Um, so given that this is a retail and service sector, let me start by talking about my own, ser my own service. So our business, how have we done? And um, here I can speak about uh, not just the business that I run, but the overall group that I work within. So I work for the Hassan al Lem Construction and Property Development Group. Uh, and here I can say that in the property sector, we have seen a slowdown in sales for most of uh, the, the companies in the, operating in the market. And that's because their customers are people operating across many different sectors. And on the construction side, we had a momentary slowdown while we were trying to understand, and the country was trying to understand what the impact of COVID was uh, and how fast it would spread and how susceptible Egypt was to it. And uh, honestly, in my side of the business, the service sector, uh, we were not that affected, uh, but that is a function of various things. Um, so we were not very affected. I have 2,000 staff with an average age of about 29 years old. And I think that's a relevant uh, statistic because uh, we know that COVID attacks or, or, or hits the elderly more than it hits the young. Uh, so uh, we, were, we were quite negligibly affected from a health perspective. Uh, of course, we introduced various um, health measures as well, uh, but um, we did not feel, and some of our costs went up in terms of, you know, protective equipment and hand sanitizing and so on. Uh, but other than that, we were not very affected operationally. Those of our clients who suffered the most were, to the topic of today's conversation, the retail sector. So the shopping malls in particular, who we service. And I mean, this was a direct consequence of the, um, uh, I don't know if there was a, an actual uh, decline in their operations, but there was simply just a shortage of footfall. There weren't enough customers coming out, and that's a result of just caution. The sentiment was that this is a disease that can go, you know, uh, wildly across the country, uh, across the world, and so people at first stayed in. To the best of my knowledge, most of the retail customer, retail giants across Egypt have largely recovered the losses that they suffered in the early period. Um, now, what, what is important to understand here is that the, and this is true for both the retail sector and the industrial sector, and I'll just make this one comment and then I'll wrap up and hand over, um, that industries like retail and like industrial require momentum. Uh, and it's some, sometimes referred to as circular logistics or just momentum. It doesn't matter if uh, the sales are all recovered later on. The fact that there was a slowdown in the middle so that the suppliers that are supplying the shops had to slow down and the raw materials goods that were supplying those suppliers had to slow down or stop. 
just a slowdown in itself means that this kind of circular rotation of goods and logistics, when it slows down, it's very costly and difficult to start it up again. And I think this is one of the reasons you've seen so many governments pump so much money into prop up businesses, you know, a little bit in Egypt with, with tax relief and tax holidays and so on, but in other countries in particular where you've seen huge amounts of the GDP pumped into prop up retailers and industrialists and so on, it's to avoid a slowdown or a stoppage of this circular momentum. Because once it stops, it's very, very difficult to start it up again. And you can imagine if it's agricultural producers that suddenly have to stop harvesting and then the supermarkets run out of food. Of course, all those sales can be made up later, but just the fact that you have to remobilize again is very costly and product can be damaged along the way. Uh, infrastructure that you may have in place, depending on continuous supply, you may suddenly no longer be able to afford, so you have to relinquish it. And then once you start up again, you have to bring it all back online. So um, to, to just sort of wrap up, in Egypt, whether it's in the retail sector or the service sector or the industrial sector, uh, of course, there was a momentary slowdown. To the best of what I can see, a lot of this is being recovered. And alhamdulillah, we did not suffer too much of a momentum disruption yet. Uh, we should note, of course, that we haven't seen the end of this disease yet. Other countries suffered a much greater momentum disruption, and their countries had to plow huge amounts of capital in to avoid it. I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you very much, uh, Engineer Hissam, for this uh, very interesting uh, perspective about what's going on in the retail sector, the service sector, uh, you know, and the shopping malls in particular. And thank you for sharing uh, this good news that we have not been really affected that much and uh, things are starting really to catch up. So uh, we are lucky in one way or another versus uh, many other markets. Okay, uh, Mr. Uh, Ayman uh, Ashur um, is someone that can share with us or has experience in valuations in the gaming industry, in uh, purchasing power. So uh, what is going on when it comes to retail in terms of valuation of, of uh, you know, uh, businesses in terms of the gaming industry, which I know you have a lot of uh, experience in. And what is going on with the purchasing power is something that we would really like to know from you uh, regarding that. The floor is all yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hamid, and uh, thank you to AUC for having me, and thanks for uh, the, uh, the introductions. Um, I think it's, it's, uh, it's been, you know, sort of a crazy period because you look at, I mean, I'm gonna, I hope I don't ramble on for too long, so you're gonna need to stop me. <laughs> but uh, if, if you look, if we start out by the point you mentioned with the valuations, I mean, anybody now can look at the stock market and see incredible valuations, and especially, you know, for companies like Amazon, etc. So it is, you know, so there has been a lot going on. Part of it is driven by the very low interest rates. Part of it is driven by the fact that the interest rates are likely to remain low for a long time. So there is a lot of capital out there and this capital is not gonna go into bonds, is not gonna go into fixed interest, you know, sort of assets, is gonna go somewhere. So it is gonna go into, you know, uh, the stock market. And if it goes into the stock market, it's also gonna end up going into, you know, VCs and private equities, et cetera. So where, you know, you're, so that's been, um boosting valuations quite a bit but it is not across the board because we see a lot of uh, sectors you know uh, where valuations has been hit you know pretty hard you know especially things like the travel industry and cruise lines airlines etc and restaurants so all of these and and the services the companies that cater to the service of you know restaurants so so this is when you talk about the purchasing power, you need to be thinking of the purchasing power, not just of the consumer, but of the businesses. So if you have um, a business that is, you know, selling, you know, payment systems to small restaurants and the like, it is probably struggling right now or hotels and, and the like. So it is, most of it is intuitive when you dig into it a bit more on the surface, it becomes shocking that you have all of these crazy valuations 
when the market when the when the GDP of the various countries around the world is declining rapidly, you have super high valuations. Uh, but when you start digging into it, you understand the logic of it a bit more. Um, the uh, you mentioned gaming industry. Gaming industry has been booming, uh, mainly because people are staying at home. They are in lockdown, you know, so probably the biggest benefactors, you know, of, of big, biggest beneficiaries of, of the um, uh, of, of the uh, of COVID have been, you know, things like the gaming industry, the alcohol industry, the cannabis industry in the US, uh, Netflix, you know, all, all of the things that you can do at home. So uh, gaming has been phenomenal. And we've seen that with the gaming industry in 2008. Um, but this here again, the purchasing power issue comes into play because the people who are staying at home playing games all day and all night and spending huge amount of money, sooner or later, they run out of money if they are not employed elsewhere. So while it is a bonanza for us right now in the gaming industry, we're not too sure how it will be going forward. Um, a lot of other things that I see with different startups, particularly in, in, in the Middle East, are you know, things related to the do-it-yourself market. Uh, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of companies uh, that are you know, getting more active. Uh, the other important trend that I'm seeing is companies that have not had e-commerce or had not had the ability to do business on the net are actually creating that. And it is not just small companies, it, it is even very big companies. Like I live in the UK right now, one of the biggest supermarkets we have is a supermarket called Morrison's. Morrison's didn't have, before COVID, did not have you know, delivery did not have online ordering. And in the last, you know, few months, they have created an incredible infrastructure where they have created all of the online delivery originally uh, through subcontractors eventually on their own. Um, I, I was showing, uh, you, know, the you know, your colleagues from the AUC before you joined, uh, you know, the, uh, the platform I'm on right now which is um, it, it's a it's a platform for you know uh, online meetings where you can do all kinds of uh, you know things on the you know for uh, teaching for education. So I use this you know quite a lot when I'm teaching you know sort of you know where I'm going in and explaining you know sort of different things and you know uh, so you're using you know so it, it's a it's a nice you know, way of, uh, of, of um, sort of exploiting the situation because people are in Zoom meetings all the time. So what do you do? You try to make it more efficient and more productive. So this is a company that started in April. Um, within about a month or so had uh, financing from Sequoia and several VCs and just launched their product uh, out of San Francisco. So it is a lot of things are happening, you know, the, the more nimble companies are adapting, are, you know, the agile ones are adapting quickly, the less agile are not. So, you know, uh, I, I hope that sort of gives you a quick flavor, uh, you know, and I hope that answered, you know, you know, because you've asked me a lot of questions, so I hope I, you know, at least sort of started the discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Ayman, for this, uh, you know, uh, answer about, uh, you know, different things, but it really helps us get some perspective about different aspects about, uh, as you mentioned, valuation, you know, the gaming industry, uh, you know, and what is going on uh, there. Okay, Ahmed is uh, the co-founder of uh, Tasketi, and, uh, you know, uh, we would love to hear from you about your story you know, with Tasketi and what you are doing today, you know, in these times, how are you uh, adapting or as Ayman mentioned, uh, how are you agile, you know, how you are doing your business in a different way these days is something that we would definitely love to hear about, uh, you know, uh, you know, regarding this. Ahmed, the floor is all yours. 
Um, thank you, Dr. Hamid. Uh, first, uh, good evening for everyone. And thank you, Dr. Hamid and Dr. Hala for your kind invitation. I'm really happy to be here today. Uh, I'm the CEO and co-founder at, uh, at TaskT.com. TaskT is an online marketplace for home services, as you mentioned. Uh, the company started like six years ago, and uh, we've been doing the same business for, for six years now in Egypt. So uh, we know the seasonality is a normal seasonality. And actually, we were we were there, but uh, in, in, the, in some of the major events that happened in Egypt, and uh, we can compare the changes or the differences between the, the events happening now and, uh, and previous events. Uh, Actually, we were doing really fine uh, before COVID. Uh, and then suddenly, uh, once the pandemic started to spread in Egypt, I can say that it was very interesting that the drop, we, 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 uh, we were really impacted in sales. And just like happened in, in like a couple of days after the lockdown, uh, as if the people really started to think that, no, now that this is big and we should start to think if we would need the service now or not, is it safe to have it or not? And in just a couple of days after the lockdown, we started to see a huge impact in the in the number of daily orders of daily requests. Uh, the the main I'll, I'll speak here about the consumer or the B2C uh, part of the business because Mr. Hussain is an expert in the B2B, so he can speak about it uh, much better than me. Uh, so people started at the at the beginning. People started to say, okay, now. It's not safe to bring someone into your house. Uh, let's wait and see what will happen. And then the problem, the lockdown, the day was really short. So when you have a, when you need the service, it will take much more much more time, especially with the, with the services that needs more time, like house painting and or if you are doing a big uh, a big changes in in your house, it will take multiple days because the technician need to finish really fa really early uh, to uh, to get a chance to use the metro or, or the public transportation to go home before uh, the lockdown so people were postponing uh, the big uh, the big uh, home uh, renovations because it's not a good time for it because it would take much longer time and uh, it was it was an, it, it was an, a, a tough a tough area a, a tough uh, period for our business like for two months we started to say what we need now, uh, how how can we survive this storm and and continue uh, the success that was happening before the COVID? So we even received some uh, advice that we should pivot completely and build something different. And actually, we were uh, we were against this 100%. Uh, we were thinking that it's a it's a basic need. People will never stop cleaning their house. People will never stop. Uh, their need for a plumber, electrician, or pest control company. Uh, yes, there will be a different uh, market and a different even world after COVID, but we believe that the services that we are offering is a basic need of the human being. So yeah, it will be impacted for a while, but the demand will, will, will get back to normal after the COVID uh, start to, to uh, Let's say not end because it's not end yet, but once things start to get better, people will get back to their normal behavior. Uh, and actually, this is, this has happened. This happened in the, in the, we recovered 100% and even crossed our pre-COVID numbers in the, in the past two months. Uh, at the beginning, there was a big fear of ordering uh, home services because you don't want, you don't you, you don't want anyone to come into your house. Then. Uh, the, the effect of, of the purchasing power started in the in April. In April, we started to see people who are really uh, uh, loyal customer and ordering every week or even twice per week started to reduce the frequency of ordering. You know, they started to order just once per week instead of two times per week. Why? Because definitely their income is not is not the same and even if if, if they didn't lose their, their job they have some fear that they might lose it at some point in time later so we started to see the impact of of the purchasing power in april and then started to recover gradually since then and as i told you in september we 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 achieved our best pre covid number and in october actually our sales is, is higher than 10 percent higher than our pre covid uh, numbers uh, now we are in the middle, not in the middle, but I, I have a medical background, so I say that we now close to the peak of the second wave, um, I guess two or three weeks close to the peak of the second wave. Uh, and we started to see some effect on the ordering, but 
surprisingly, it's very minimal and people are not afraid at the first time. Uh, this is because we, from our side, we are trying to assure our customers that we are taking all the health precautions that we can. There is a protective measures and uh, uh, it's, it will be safe to order uh, the service from a company instead of ordering a freelancer because we do what we can to, to keep the service as, as, uh, as safe as possible. During the, the, the very bad time and the impact of COVID on us, we pivoted a little bit, but it was really effective. Number one, we started to offer uh, uh, sanitization services for homes and for offices and for companies and for factories. And actually, we started to, to launch it very, very quickly and started to pick up really fast. And uh, it compensated a lot of the losses in the, in the sales. And now it's even until now, it's still, it's still working very well. This is number one. Number two, we started to change the marketing mix and we started to do an analysis to, to discover which services that's least impacted by COVID. And we started to focus on marketing those services instead of the services that was impacted really heavily. Uh, so we started to change the marketing mix and promote the services that was not impacted very, 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 very tough. One very important thing is that we started a real good plan of bootstrapping. We were bootstrapping to the last penny. We tried to uh, restructure our cost structure and we tried to get rid of any amount of money that we can get rid of, even if it's 100 Egyptian pounds. We, if we can stop spending it, we, we don't spend it. Uh, sure, uh, this, this helped a lot to reduce the burn rate during the bad time and to survive the storm. And sure, there was a lot of support from our uh, investors in Cairo Angels and 500 startups and all the other investors. One of the many challenges that we were facing is uh, we, we cannot have face-to-face -face, uh, interactions with our technicians. This was a very, very important part because part of what we do is that we do continuous education, continuous one-to-one -one coaching, continuous trainings for our technicians. So suddenly the office is, is, is closed and we can't bring this number of people to, in the same place. So we started to pivot at the beginning. We, we started to do it over the phone. In the beginning, it was really bad and the, the quality was not the best and the training efficiency was not the best. But time after time, we started to get better than it. We started to set a quality structure uh, and, 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 and quality systems that doesn't require that the technician comes to the office. So for like four months, we were able to uh, keep our training, one-to-one -one coaching and everything on the phone and it was extremely successful. Uh, now we are recovering. Uh, as I told you, we started to see some impact this month on sales, but it's very, very minimal. It's like five, seven percent, something like this. Uh, I hope this time the impact will be less and we are ready for it because we, we, we experienced it before. Uh, and I, I'm, I believe, again, uh, the services is, some services, most of the services is a, is a basic need. People will never stop ordering food. People will never stop cleaning their houses. People will never stop going to schools. It may change a little bit, but it will stay there. And once this pandemic ends, the market will be open again. I, I don't think, yeah, it's a, a change will happen, but it's not that big. And we can see that we recovered 100% in like three months in the first wave with all the fears that was happening, with all the anxiety for the first time for the humanity to deal with this pandemic. A service company that was in the, in the middle of the eye of the storm recovered 100% in three months. So I don't think it's that bad later, but uh, now, yeah, we are in a tough time and I hope it, it, it will pass eventually. Thank you very much, uh, Ahmed, for sharing uh, your story and uh, your business and how you were able to adapt and change your strategy during these uh, challenging times. So having listened to our three uh, panelists, I would like to open the floor for any questions that you would like to have to uh, our uh, panelists uh, now. I don't see anyone so far asking a question, but if you have, you can raise your hand or you can type it in the chat box and I'll be glad to address it to uh, all or some of the panel members. Maybe I can start, uh, you know, a comment or a question here. Face-to-face uh, -face or brick and mortar and online. This is always a question. It's no longer a question, by the way, going online, uh, you, you have to go online. And you know, with the, the current situation that we are facing, you know, companies have been forced to go online. It's, it's not an option. 
But the question is the ratio, to what extent I have a store or I go online. The fact of the matter is many people think that most people today buy online. Maybe the ratio has increased, but globally 90% of people buy from brick and mortar stores and 10% buy online. You come to Egypt and it's even, you know, close to maybe like something like 97% or even 98% buy from a store and 2% buy online. So this is always, this ratio is always a challenge I find for a lot of retailers because this business model is not the same like this business model. You know, an online business and operating an online business is not the same like operating a brick and mortar store. So uh, where should we invest more? Should we invest more in our online? Is this just a temporary period of time and then people will come back to the store uh, or we should keep the balance or, or what exactly? I think Ayman is nodding his head. Maybe he has, uh, you know, a few points uh, to share here. Ayman? Uh, it, it, it's, I think it's a very interesting question. And I, I think the answer will be uh, very different in different parts of the world. Um, you know, I tell you, I mean, I, I, I came back from San Francisco to England in March, and I have not traveled since then. And shortly after the pandemic started, I went to the bank, to the ATM, and I got 300 pounds out in, you know, because I wanted to have, you know, enough physical cash in. Uh, I still have almost all of it. I think that the total cash spending that I have made between March, end of March 2020, and now, you know, towards the end of November 2020, is less than 200 Egyptian pounds or 400 Egyptian pounds. I spent very, very little in cash. So here in a, in a place uh, like the UK and, you know, my family in the US, it is almost, you know, the vast majority is online. Will it remain online forever? No because part of the entertainment is, you know, part of the fulfillment is physically going in and, you know, shopping. And, you know, so it is, you know, shopping itself is a, is a, is a pastime, is, a, is, is part of, you know, is part of the entertainment industry. So uh, you, you'll always have both, but I think it is, um, it is gonna be very hard to, uh, to go back to at least in the West and the more advanced countries where the infrastructure and the payment and all of that already exists, it would be very hard to, to go back to, uh, you know, to, to fully, you know, bricks and mortar. Uh, so it is, you know, some of the change is just not reversible. Some of the places that have closed down are not gonna reopen. Okay. Because there is this idea that yes, physical stores, uh, because there is always this debate, no, physical stores will always be there. But the, but the concept of the store will be different. Yeah. So, uh, you know, people will not uh, go to uh, buy, uh, but they want an experience. They exactly. do uh, web roaming, uh, you know, and they go there just to pick up, you know, just to make their order and just to pick it up. So uh, I think the concept of the store, I'm a believer that we'll still have physical stores. But the yeah, role we, we of the store is going to be different. Definitely will, yes. Yeah? yes. Uh, the experience is going to be different. And the best example, uh, example of this is Amazon. You know, everyone is going online and then they have the Amazon Go store. But the Amazon Go store is not like any other store. You, you go inside and then you just leave without waiting in line in the cashier uh, to make your payment. Okay, I have uh, a question here from uh, the BA, Maryam, uh, to uh, Mr. Hossam Allem, uh, Allem. Why do you think there was a slowdown in the construction industry due to COVID? Couldn't this slowdown be due to government regulation and halting construction generally? So the biggest investor in the country today is the government. They're investing aggressively in roads and bridges, in infrastructure, including, uh, uh, well, roads and bridges, water treatment plants, desalination, 
um, and of course the enormous investment in the new capital city. So by far, most of the construction work that we get is from the government at the moment. Um, and I can say, because I was close to the discussions, that when Corona, when COVID-19 first broke and the government was uh, trying to formulate strategy uh, and policy around it, uh, we were among the people who pushed very hard that the government should shut down all construction sites for two weeks to give them capacity room just to stop and think and breathe. Uh, you know, what, what do we do next? So we volunteered and uh, we uh, coordinated with our, uh, you know, the, the other players in the market that we would support the government by saying, let us stop construction for two weeks to give you a chance just to think what you want to do next. And uh, of course, you know, all salaries and all subcontractors and everybody would be fully paid. So, I mean, the government never asked the construction sector to stop work. It came from industry, it came from the competitors or the, the construction companies who volunteered that slowdown. And then since we have started work again, the government has not asked us to slow down or, or stop work or anything like that. There's been no policy directive in that direct in, in, in along those lines. But of course, they're asking all businesses to do their part in providing the appropriate protective measures for staff, supporting uh, workers if they get sick and their families, uh, which I think, frankly, all businesses have an obligation to do. There are times when you can focus on uh, bottom line and there are times when you have to look at the broad uh, uh, good, especially in a country like Egypt. Okay, thank you very much, Hassan, for that. Uh, I have a question that I would like to raise to, uh, to Ahmed. Since many of our students are taking entrepreneurship and we promote, you know, startups and so forth, is this a good time to start a new business to do to to, to have a startup? Uh, well, it depends because it, it based on the, you know the startups usually start with an idea. It's not it it it. it the start is not always an entrepreneur who wants to build business, so he can select between different industries. Usually, the entrepreneur got a very, very uh, strong idea in his head, and we want to see it happening. So he is usually the, the main drive is is how much he's interested in this idea and how much is he interested in this change to happen. So some businesses, it's a good time to start, like. Uh, it tech, for example, uh, online payment, uh, logistics, delivery, all the stuff. But some businesses, it is not the best time for it. So maybe you can start now because it will need some time to finish your product and test it and get your feedback from customers. But don't expect to get funded. For example, if you are doing a new brand new, uh, let's say, uh, service company, for example. Uh, a company like Taskfee. Maybe it's not a very good time to start now because the appetite of the investors to invest in this sector now will not be the best. But if you are planning to build your product and take it easy and understand the market and start to hear back your customers, uh, to launch like within six months from now, eight months from now, it might be a good idea to start thinking about it now. But launching it now at this time, you will need capital and you will need interest from the customers. So it's not the best time for it. So it depends on the industry. Uh, but I believe that many VCs got a lot of money that was not deployed this year. And, you know, VCs need to deploy their the capital they have because it's their mandate with the LPs and all the stuff. So most probably after this pandemic uh, resolve, it will be a good appetite for investment in general. Uh, but the industry is, is a little bit sensitive to start right now. In Tasty, the, we received some small investments, bridge investment from our, our old investors, but it happened because they trust this team, they trust this market, and they got a very, very long uh, track record with KPIs and all the stuff. So they know that once the market is back to normal, this company will, will get back to business. But for for a new for a new startup, I don't know. Maybe maybe uh, uh, Dr. Ayman uh, agree with me. It would be hard for an investor to invest in a new service company at this time. Maybe maybe it would be hard for them to do this. But for other industries, I guess yes. 
for some industries that was that was booming during the pandemic. It take for example. I, also, I got another another comment on your on your past question about uh, should the retails close their doors and go completely online. Uh, as I told you, e-commerce e e is always my 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 hobby. I, I love to read about it and I know a lot about it. So during the past uh, months, uh, many of my friends who have retail business came to me. Now we need to launch an online business to do what we do. Uh, I was saying it's not an easy business to do. You need to have knowledge in digital marketing. You need to have knowledge in technicality. You need to have a very good product managers. E-commerce is, is an industry by itself. It, it doesn't matter what you are selling services or products, but you need to have to learn about the e-commerce and this won't happen overnight. So the big companies can hire the best teams, the best product managers, the best CTOs and build their online store in a, in, in a month and launch and do the right marketing campaign. And it happened and they succeed. But for small businesses with no, with no previous experience in e-commerce, most of the cases I saw, usually they spend a very, very big amount of money to launch a store that's not working well and not doing sales. And actually they shortened their runway because they spend a very, a, 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 lot, of, a lot of cash in the time that you should be strapping, good strapping. So my advice is if you want to go online and you don't have experience in, 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 in the online business and you don't have enough cash to, to hire the best team ever, my advice just go to suit.com or Jumia and open a store there and learn how, how it happened. And then later you can, you can do the full transformation if you want to do it in, in the times that you have some experience in this market. So I was just commenting on, the, on your last question. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Ayman, do you have any additional reflections uh, on this about starting a new business and uh, uh, you know, the, the appetite to invest in uh, new startups? In these uh, days. I, I think Esra Gebeli got it exactly right. I, uh, you know, her comment is absolutely right. Uh, it depends on the idea. There are some ideas where uh, there are, uh, you know, uh, it's a good time to start. Uh, it's a great time to start, actually, in some cases. And the, um, the point that uh, Ahmed Galal just made about VCs having some money is a very legitimate one. Uh, but the main thing is that whatever startup idea you have, I come to the original point, uh, Dr. Hamid, that you made about the purchasing power that you need to have, if, 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 you're, if you got a new product and it, or a new idea, who's the target of that idea? Is the target of that idea somebody who's cash strapped or somebody who has some purchasing power? So that is really uh, the the, uh, the the big thing. So, um, but but I think you know she answered the question. <laughs> Great uh, follow up question from uh, the BA uh, to Mr. Ayman. How do you see the retail disruptions, building on our previous point here, differ from one country to another? Any cultural inputs uh, in this regard? Uh, yes, it, it is radically different from one country to another. It is, you know, I, I mean, if you see, you know, in, in uh, let's take Egypt, for example, where it's a country where bank, you know, a, a huge percentage of the population is underbanked, is not banked at all. So you've got issues of payment and uh, payment problems. So it is... Um, you know, so, so you're, you've got a lot of short-term opportunities on payment. And, you know, you will get a lot of people, you know, think, you know, sort of keep calculating, you know, that the payment industry is, you know, huge. So if I get 0 0.001 cent per transaction, there's gonna be millions, but it is ultimately short-term because the solution to the problem eventually is gonna be fairly simple where you're gonna get people banked one way or another. So once you, you solve the problem, then you know, you've crossed these opportunities. But a lot, of, a lot of business is all about exploiting imperfections. So if you have an imperfection in a market in the way the market is structured and you exploit it, then that's great. Uh, so, so the imperfections in a market like Egypt are huge. There are so many of them. So there are always ways where you can jump in. 
um, you know, in, in you know, in the U.S., you know, the whole you got a whole new sector of, you know, sort of sanitizing services, you know, services of you know, sanitization services of quality check for COVID, you know, COVID proofing and and all of that. So it it is varying. And it's also, um, it's just like within Egypt itself, like I haven't been to Egypt now since February, but I'm told that, you know, uh, you, you basically have the two societies in Egypt, people who are worried about themselves, who are wearing masks or continuing to sanitize and people who have already said COVID, what COVID, you know? So you've got that, what you see in Egypt is what you see between different countries. Okay, thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, here is a comment I think that I think Engineer Hossam uh, can comment on from uh, Hela. The pandemic would bring in huge technology innovation in facility services, maybe like robots. Are we starting to see something like this? Are we gonna see more of this? Or is this something that uh, we can dream of but uh, difficult to happen? No, that's not a dream at all. We're already starting to see robotics in facility services, but that's regardless of COVID. There's two areas where we're seeing robotics. One is in cleaning. Uh, and I mean, I think we've all seen these little robots that, that sort of zip around the house cleaning. But I mean, that can be scaled up to very large centers. So I'm actually about to buy a set of robots to clean some conference centers that have big open spaces. But in general, we are going to see more artificial intelligence and robotics uh, creeping into the maintenance space as well on a large scale where uh, we can, well, and, and virtual reality, I was about to say augmented reality, but probably Egypt is a bit away from that. But definitely uh, virtual reality where you can sort of walk through the site. You know, once you enter a site that needs maintenance, you can sort of see the site physically and you can see it virtually and have uh, you know, the, the features pop up in the site where you're working that see, so to help you see what it is, the, what's the job that's expected to do. Uh, but I mean, COVID or not, robotics is coming. I cannot think of an example right now off the top of my head where a robot can do a job uh, that a person would not be able to do because of COVID. Um, I, don't, I don't think we're there. But I mean, robotics are coming and you're, you're going to be seeing it very soon in Egypt, uh, even in spaces that, uh, that you and I would visit. Great, great. As an uh, expert, also someone that is close to the real estate uh, uh, industry, can you give us some highlights about this? Because people always, you know, it's, it's a very important driver of the economy. A lot of businesses heavily depend uh, on the real estate market. So uh, what has happened? Because also we get, uh, you know, different and conflicting information. Uh, is this bubble gonna happen at one point in time or uh, demand for real estate uh, and investment in real estate will always be a golden opportunity? Uh, I think you asked the question, is the bubble going to happen? I don't think it can become a bigger bubble than it has been and is at the moment. Uh, I think the question is, is the bubble going to burst? And uh, my, my opinion on that is that no, the real estate bubble in Egypt will not burst, but it will and it is slowing down. Um, so we're already seeing a slowdown in the amount of construction in real estate. Uh, it is slower to sell projects for us and for our competitors already. And the size class of properties that we're selling and the, the type of properties we're selling is also changing. The purchase for pure investment is slowing down uh, quite a bit and people are purchasing properties for use by them or their children. Um, also, we're seeing the size of properties uh, scaling down a little bit. It's no longer huge obnoxious uh, properties by the big real estate developers. It's becoming much more apartment duplex, uh, you know, um, uh, vertical living rather than horizontal living. And that's, uh, that's also, that's not just a function of COVID, uh, but that's a function generally of a saturation in the market in the uh, kind of large size class uh, and a factor of um, electricity and water becoming more expensive and the currency reflecting the economy a bit more realistically, which means that maintenance costs, etc., are relatively much higher than they were even five, six years ago. So people are moving towards smaller living uh, and that is probably a more realistic model for Egypt anyway, because there's a lot of young people coming into the uh, economy who uh, are looking for properties in a more manageable size for them. 
so no, uh, real estate will not burst because, you know, mashallah, Egyptians are very good at uh, procreating and uh, growing in numbers. So they will continue to uh, need uh, housing across many different demographics. Uh, but we are seeing a shift in the sorts of properties that are being sold. And I think that's a very healthy shift, you know, uh, because it's serving a real uh, social demand as opposed to just being a great big black hole uh, within which you can throw cash uh, and tie it up basically from a more useful part of the economy. I mean, I shouldn't say this because I work in real estate, but let's be honest. I mean, the, the hundreds of billions of Egyptian pounds that are tied up in bricks and concrete and, and names, you know, fancy, fancy project names today when they could be being deployed in service companies and, and industry and retail and so on, where they would have more of a multiplier effect. Uh, it's it's good that we're moving towards a smaller scale real re, real estate uh, model, a smaller property type real estate model. Thank you very much uh, for that. I can see both Ayman and Ahmed want to uh, reflect on that. Uh, Ayman, uh, just a couple of uh, examples from my my old company company I started, Identiv. Uh, a couple of products that have just come out since uh, you know since COVID. One is a, an RFID temperature sensor. So you can actually sort of, you know, a, a, and in, in addition to various RFID for, you know, tracing, you know, tracking and tracing people and, and all of that. Uh, the other one is uh, with the huge number of um, working from home, uh, the issue of especially in you know things like the banking industry and financial industry and and in many cases even medical industry where you need to have authentication and secure you know how, how is that how you know level higher level of security to access information and to access you know so authentication authentication of users and security for users you know whether it's on their you know computer at home or phone at home so that whole area has been very active as well and a lot of spending going on there thank you thank you very much uh, ahmed uh, yes i was adding to uh, to what mr hussam was saying about the technology or, or the question you were asking about adding robots and and uh, artificial intelligence and all of this to the to the facility management business actually i'm i was living in egypt for the most of my life so uh, uh, I see the market here, yes, this will come for sure. And I see those robots have started to be popular somehow and people have started to buy them from abroad and bring them here. It's it's nice to have and some people will, 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 will really use it and it will be nice for places like big conference and all this stuff. But I see the technology role in facility management and similar services like maintenance and, and cleaning. It will be more into making it easier for to do the connection between the technician and the and the customer and the and the, and the end customer. Until now, most of the people start doing services the way they used to do, like by going to the freelancer in the street or going to the, to to the web or whatever. But soon it, this will change. So the channels that people consume the service will will change. Start be more digital. Also. There will be a lot of, of, of role or in, in technology will play a, a major role in making the services less expensive by using by by using better the the time of the of the of the manpower you know better utilizing the time of the manpower to do more tasks in a very short time uh, and making sure that their schedule is 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 100% occupied and there is no uh, unsold inventory in terms of technicians and cleaners and and and, uh, and blue callers to be able to offer the service for a cheap price because that's exactly what Uber did. It was it was making the best out of every minute of the driver to make sure that he's he's occupied and doing money all the time so the prices can can decrease. I think this will be the next big change in the facility management and the service industry in general is to making the best of the time of the service provider to be able to serve more more customers and this will mean less money that the customer need to pay actually we're working on a, on a similar project with my friend Hussam, and uh, it's it's focused on this exact point 
that we use technology to make sure that our suppliers are 100% occupied. And this will mean that we can offer the services for a price that no one else can compete with. So um, that, that was my, my comment on, the, on this question. Thank you very much, Ahmed. Here is a question, another question for you, Ahmed. Uh, during your uh, study, which service provided required minimum contact and interaction? Sorry, again? During your study, I think maybe the question is during the COVID, yeah. which service yeah. provided yeah. required minimum contact and interaction? Uh, mainly, it depends on the time that the supplier spent at the customer house. Uh, this is the main thing. So cleaning was the maximum, uh, need the maximum contact because usually the supplier will spend most of the day in the customer house and maintenance was much less. Uh, there's some services like uh, and this was very popular, by the way, during the COVID because everyone was watching the TV all the time and they would need to get themselves entertained. So the, the cable, the, the satellite dish receiver uh, service was, was doing really well during the COVID. Uh, it requires very, very little uh, contact because usually he's working outside the house. Um, the maintenance is usually does not require very, very much contact with the customer. And it happens in, in a very short time, like for plumbing, electricity service, uh, carpentry. And these were extremely basic. The surprise that the maintenance services was not, almost was not affected at all during the, bad, the, the, the first wave of COVID. The sales were, was almost normal. So, but the cleaning was impacted heavily. Uh, it recovered later, but in, in March, April, and May, it was, re it was really heavily impacted. Thank you very much, uh, Ahmad. I don't see we have any more uh, questions. So before we end, I would like to ask each of the panelists, during these times, you know, what advice would you give to entrepreneurs? What, what should an entrepreneur do, whether starting in the middle of their business, you know, from your experience, you know, what should they do? Hossein? Um, there's probably many things they should do, but I will focus on two. Uh, the first is don't panic. In crisis, there's opportunity. Uh, at the very simplest end of the opportunity is to um, just learn how to operate at low cost. Uh, that's an important skill. Uh, Ahmed Gelid and I have this conversation regularly. If he had 10 times as much money to play with, he would be 10 times sloppier in how he spent it. Uh, there is real opportunity in being stuck for cash and learning how to innovate and you know, use guerrilla tactics to, um, to, to operate. Um, and in general, I think in crisis also, if you can be resilient and make uh, good, astute, calm decisions, uh, you can maybe sit back, not sit back, but I mean, you know, you can hold down the, the ship and watch your competitors self-destruct. So the first piece of advice is don't panic uh, and just uh, learn from the experience. And the second thing I would say, especially in the service sector, uh, is uh, you really, it's a, again, in crisis comes an opportunity to really show who you are. Uh, so you stand by your customers, show your values, uh, show them that you stand by them, support them. You can maybe be flexible in the offering that you give them. Uh, you can maybe wait for payment or help them out, you know, and communicate with them regularly and, and, uh, and transparently. Uh, the institutions have memories. And even if they don't remember the specific incident of what you did for them at some point, there's a kind of relationship and a bond that's formed between a service provider and a client uh, in a time of crisis. So there are many opportunities both to uh, create new market space or to strengthen your, uh, your company's knowledge and infrastructure or just to strengthen your relationships with customers in a crisis like this one. Thank you very much, Hossam. That was really very uh, inspiring. Uh, Ayman? Well, I, uh, I tend to give lots of, lots of advice uh, to, uh, to startups, uh, whether it's Facebook or mentoring or what have you. But uh, I, I guess I'll, uh, I'll focus on just two things. Uh, number one, please don't call yourself an entrepreneur. You know, so uh, that, that's, you know, just, you know, you're starting a business, you know, you're starting a business. Let's not give big terminology, uh, especially if you call yourself serial entrepreneur, 
and your, you know, that just drives me crazy. Uh, the, 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 the serious advice is don't be afraid of failure. Uh, it, it's a crisis situation. Uh, you can't help it. Sometimes a business is distant to, to fail, uh, that the factors for success are not there. And, um, you know, uh, your business failing does not mean you personally have failed. So uh, it is not, uh, it, it is it's perfectly all right to start an adventure that you have not planned for what's happening with COVID uh, and it impacts you very heavily and you end up having to shut down. That's okay. That does not mean you're a bad human being, does not make you a failure or anything. So if you're gonna be starting somewhere, you have to make sure you're prepared to accept failure when the circumstances are outside of your control. Um, last advice is co-founders. Uh, forget about, especially in a place like Egypt, with all the complexities, uh, dealing with government, dealing with market, dealing with collections and all of that, you're out of your mind if you think you can do a startup without co-founders, serious, serious co-founders. So uh, that, that's what I have. <laughs> I can keep going till tomorrow, <laughs> but you know, that's what I have for now. Thank you very much, uh, Ayman. I have to say, uh, you know, that uh, we should not be ashamed of failure. We should not be ashamed of making mistakes. Uh, I know it's a cultural thing that when someone fails, it is not good to, uh, you know, to, to tell other people that you failed. But this is how we learn by failure and failures. And, uh, you know, this is how successful people are because they learn from their mistakes. And I know a lot of entrepreneurs that tried it once and they failed. They tried it once, to a second time and they failed. And they are trying it for the third time, you know, and this is the whole, uh, you know, learning experience there. Uh, Ahmed? Uh, yes, uh, I 100% agree with Hussam. Um, growth is important, but for this period of the human history, cash is the king. So be extremely lean, extremely uh, cash efficient. Every penny make a difference uh, during the bad time. Uh, this is number one. Number two, uh, try to be as innovative as you can, but without, you know, uh, following uh, an idea of I'll do a new, totally new product right now and it will boom. Yeah, and you spend every, every, all the money you got to build the new product. In a very tough time, you don't have the, the chance to meet your team in the proper way. We are using Zoom and we don't have human interaction and we are all uh, under anxiety. So it's not the right time to think about a total 100% pivot of your business right now, unless you are really an experienced person in, in, in the other model that you are going to and you have decent amount of cash that you are can be sure that you will survive this pivot. Because I see a lot of entrepreneurs, especially at the early stages, doing a very, very uh, radical pivot, uh, and they spend all their money, and it end up by clothing the company. Maybe if you put this, the same effort and innovation in your main model, you can discover something that can make you survive. So this is my 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 next thing, and I completely agree with with Dr. Ayman, but uh, you know. This, this advice is, is right, but also we cannot be so friendly with failure. I, I don't mean that failure is a bad thing or you're a bad entrepreneur when you fail or you're a bad person when you fail, but also you shouldn't give up very quickly because it's extremely hard and it's extremely challenging. And even the best entrepreneurs building the best companies at many points in their career, they were thinking, I'm not good enough to do it and I should close this company. I say, if failure is happened, is, is if you have to shut down your company, okay, be okay with it. It's part of the process, it's part of the learning process and it's part of your journey as a businessman or as an entrepreneur. But if you still got team, if you still got cash, if you still got power, if you still got some energy, try to think, try to innovate, try to save your company. Because at many points, there was times that we were said that we, were, we are going out of business and we were trying very hard until the last second and finally an idea come 
and we do it and we survive and we grow and so yeah i know it's it's we don't we don't we don't need to make it hard for entrepreneurs to fail because it's it's already hard enough but also you shouldn't give up very quickly you should make sure that you did everything you can to to succeed to success to succeed and if you don't succeed it's okay you you failed it's part of the process i failed many times before Tuskegee and and we still we're still learning all the time so Thank you very much. So, uh, you know, this is the whole uh, thing that we learn from our failures, we challenge ourselves. And it's not the end of the world when someone, uh, you know, does, uh, you know, you have to shut down and start uh, all over again. Okay, so I really want to take this opportunity to thank all of you. You know, I have to say it was a very nice learning experience for me. Thank you all for uh, being here. And I will leave Hala to make some uh, concluding remarks. Yes. Uh, thank you uh, for that uh, engaging discussion and bringing like lots of uh, topics and fields uh, in our plate tonight. I just want to end by the quote of uh, never waste a crisis. Uh, if we are taking this pandemic as a crisis, definitely there are always a silver lining in it. And I'm seeing the silver lining generally in it is the digital transformation or the digital revolution that we have all been pushed into it, especially when it comes to consumers and retails. It affects our daily lives, our daily spending behavior, our purchasing, decision making. Uh, Fab, I would really like to see how this is progressing, especially in a nascent economy like Egypt, uh, which still have a long way to go when it comes to the financial literacy, uh, legislative uh, market conditions, especially in a country like Egypt, where we do have a highly intensive labor force and how this digital impact will affect that dynamics. Will it replace them? How we are building on our human uh, resources to deploy their skills differently so that if we're seeing robots replacing the woman uh, waiting for us in the bathroom inside the mall is a robot and not a human, what the human will be doing instead? Um, I think there are lots and lots to be done as all of the great speakers have been talking about. We have lots of gaps. We have lots of opportunities, especially in Egypt. And I'm hoping all our students, entrepreneurs will, will lead us into the future of this. Uh, by this, I'd like to thank you all. Thank you, Engineer Hossam Alam. Thank you, Mr. Ayman Ashour, joining us from uh, UK. Thank you, Mr. Ahmed Gilal, for your insights and encouragement. And finally, thank you, Dr. Hamid Shama, for your time and moderating our session. Uh, we do look forward, hopefully, to see you soon on campus. Thank you very much for all of you. Thank you. Goodbye. See you soon. Thank you. Have a great night. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. Thank you all. Bye.